Hello, now we are getting into the realm of um, working with multivariate data. Again, keeping in, um, in our traditions of keeping things really, really simple and minimalistic, we are going to deal with more than two variables this time, right? So in this particular case, we're going to deal with only three variables to, be, to keep it really simple. But remember, even though we will be working with uh, three variables, Nevertheless, this case can be expanded to more than three variables, so long as you just keep one variable as your outcome, right? Which is, which is what we always do. So one outcome variable and two or more than two uh, explanatory or independent variable or predictor variable will constitute what is known as multi multiple regression. And here, we are only going to learn multiple linear regression. Of course, there can be other variations of this, but we'll just keep things very, very simple and give you a flavor of exactly how things are going to work. And you will see that exactly as we had done in um, you know, two variable case, simple linear regression, the same principles will spill over into multiple linear regression as well with some variations. So we'll learn what those are and um, we'll learn along the way. Okay, thank you. In this uh, edition of the Using R, where we're going to learn multiple linear regression. You have seen um, so far that we have talked about two variables. So, in our bivariate uh, data analysis, basically when somebody um, proceeds with uh, data analysis, it is um, it's quite traditional and probably also to some extent customary. That one starts with uh, single variables. So one variable. And that one variable obviously starts with the um, with with the, with the description of that variable. Sometimes if the variable is a continuous variable then you um, you know describe the variable in its uh, what is often referred to as a five number summary. In R of course you can use five num and then uh, function in order to describe that variable. Um, typically we are interested in case of a continuous variable um, we'd like to see that um, we describe that variables um, mean, median, and mode, um, um, you know, the, the different kinds of different percentiles of their presentations, distributions, those are the things that, um, that play on the top of our minds. At other times, um, analysts are interested to find out that we're going to work on um, other things. That is, um, if the variable is a categorical variable, then we create uh, tables of data. So we shall find out what are the labels or what are the categories of that particular categorical variable, and we plot their numbers and uh, percentages. So far, so good. We've also seen uh, that if it is a single variable, then we can plot that variable. So if it is a uh, continuous variable, we plot the uh, the continuous variable in the form of a histogram or if it's a categorical variable then we plot um, uh, the um, we, we, we conduct a bar plot and we examine the distribution of that variable. In this particular phase we are now interested to um, take two variables at a time. So the simplest case is a bivariate data analysis and we have seen that you can actually pretty much do the same things except now you're dealing with two variables and both variables in our case are continuous. Now we are interested in examining more than two variables at a time and this is important. Because quite often, and in real life, we have to work with um, more than two variables. So we have to adjust for the effect of the third variable as we find um, a relationship between an outcome variable on an explanatory variable. And when both the outcome and the explanatory variables are continuous, then we would be interested to find if we can find a linear association between them or amongst them. So then we'll say if we have got a variable y that can be regressed on two variables x1 and x2, then what is the impact of x1 on the variable y after controlling for the effects of x2? 
Sometimes it is also referred to as the impact of x1 on y, keeping x2 as constant. This can sometimes be problematic. For example, you may not have a situation where x2 can be held constant, but it will co-vary with x1. And um, so there can be issues. But by and large, this is how the conceptualizations go. And here we're going to learn how we can do that in R. In other words, if we have got a y variable which is um, continuous, if you've got an x variable which is also continuous, and we've got another variable, then how do we find uh, the relationship of the main variable which is x on y after controlling for or after adjusting for the effect of the third variable? That's the objective of this analysis. And this is known as multiple linear regression. We assume that there is going to be a linear model y is going to be regressed on x1 and x2 and because there are more than one uh, explanatory variable therefore we call it a multiple regression and um, as before we are only going to delve uh, to the surface of some of these issues we can't do an in-depth um, you know treatment to it if you want uh, more knowledge then you should consult a statistics textbook etc and some of the modules in this course i'm sure will be covering this this is part of the e partiala program and uh, my name is Arindam Basu. I'm at the University of Canterbury at Christchurch in New Zealand. And the way we're going to work is this, that we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we'll introduce the topic um, as briefly as we can. We'll, you know, elucidate or talk a little bit about the key principles. We'll run, learn, run some demo demonstrations to it and then we'll summarize the core points. So in this way, we're going to learn. Let's take a look at uh, the core objectives of, um, of, the, of this particular um, module. So as I said, I mean, we are going to solve a major problem. The problem is this, that if you have got an outcome variable or an example where you will be um, analyzing um, a data set, which has got three variables. Um, to give you an example, let's say, you are interested to study the length of stay at a hospital and you have made measurements on um, particular dosage of a drug that is given in the inpatients department and the age of a patient, right? Age of patients. You would like to um, investigate whether um, the length of stay in the hospital ward is any way related to the dosage of the drug given to these patients and whether age could be a factor that could influence this association. This is a very simplistic, almost like an artificial scenario that we have drawn here. But if this were something that you'd be interested in, then the analysis of your choice would be a multiple linear regression. Because let's say that you assume that there is a linear relationship between the drug dosage and the length of stay in the hospital. So then that would be how you would look at it. In this set of lecture, we are going to introduce some of the concepts of multiple linear regression again, keeping in context that uh, we are dealing with a particular software programming environment, which is R. So we're going to confine, confine ourselves to those because this is a rather complicated topic. It involves quite a few concepts we won't be able to touch all of these things, all of them, but we'll, we'll try. And then we'll um, learn that we can examine some assumptions and we'll do some diagnostics. Because one of the things that, that you may have already picked up in this course is this, that in general, when we use R for any kind of data analytical work, the first thing is this, that we do some sort of a graphical examination, then we run some procedures, and then we run some diagnostics, and that's how we... Um, try to make sense of the association between the various variables that we deal in this course. And uh, we should also learn how we can fit models in multiple um, linear regressions. So let us get to some preliminaries and some preliminary ideas that um, we'd like to discuss here. And um, one of the things that I usually do in, in, in discussing the preliminaries in this course, is, as you may have seen, is this, that we introduce the data sets here. But 
because this is an artificial situation and uh, you know we are trying to understand the core principles of data analysis using R, um, we may take uh, several data sets and we can take bits and pieces and uh, I just wanted to introduce you to the data set that we're going to use now. And um, you know one of the ideas that I wanted to do was that uh, we, I wanted to start analysis of some data on the crime rates in the United States but I found that um, there could be some better data sets. Um, for example there are data sets in the Julian Faraway's package which you've been using for a while. Uh, the Faraway package and they had uh, data sets such as Gala and Pima. You can load those data sets and work alongside with me. You don't necessarily have to use the data set that I am using although you can. Um, so, um, so learn from what I'm doing but use it to your own data sets. You know, there are plenty of data sets in the world around and you can just pick up that next. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the data set that I'm going to use so that it may make some sense. The data set that I'm uh, using for this um, for this uh, paper, for this work, is the data set on um, uh, the concentrations of creatine phosphokinase, which is like a muscle protein, and on age and weight. So it could be like um, explaining whether body weight can better explain creatine phosphokinase in urine or whether that is a factor that should be considered when we consider age as well. Or maybe we say that, okay, what happens as people grow older? Do creatine phosphokinase levels fall off or uh, they tend to, go, to, tend to increase? And uh, does it mean that people who have got were heavier or at, after adjusting for their weight, um, what happens to that? So, um, and the other thing, of course, is this: that on the right-hand side, you can see that the um, we have put together the summary and uh, the tables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, let's further conceptualize this model a little bit. Now. If you have the data set, that is, if you have the blood CPK data set which is included in this package, you can run with this, but if you don't, you can use your own data set. But remember that you pick up um, three variables. All the three variables must be continuous variables. And you fix as one variable as your um, outcome variable, whose variable you would like to explain and keep the other two variables as your explanatory variables and covariates. Do it in a manner that makes sense to you because without context a multiple linear regression will not much make sense to anyone, least of all to you yourself. You can use R Studio, and in the R uh, kind of um, coding window you can write the following codes. So let me go over this um, slowly to make sense of what we have done. So take up the first line, CPK, then there is a tilde, and then there is a B0 plus B1 times H plus B2 times weight. Let's make some sense of this. CPK in our context is creating phosphokinase. B0, the tilde mark is, as you know, it's, it's according to Wilkinson Rogers formula, this is the mark that we put to, um, you know, to specify that there is a, uh, a linear model that's coming. B0 actually stands for what is known as beta 0 or the intercept. B1 stands for the slope parameter for the variable age. This B1. So we have B1 times age. Now, this is the thing. While B1 times H actually is quite literally can be interpreted as a product term for B1 and H, in general, its interpretation is a little bit more complex. It's not exactly a multiple term. It is like B1 of H. So the interpretation is this, that as B1, as H increases by one unit, B1 remains constant. What will be the increment in CPK after controlling for weight and taking into consideration the intercept term. Then we add a plus sign. Now this plus sign is not a literal addition. In other words, 
you do not really add anything to get CPK. These are just there as an additional variable that we put in. And in this particular case, that additional variable is a variable of weight. That variable of weight has got a regression coefficient and that regression coefficient is beta 2 or B2, as you can see here. So we say in the, in the end that creatine phosphokinase can be explained by or predicted by a combination of age and weight. Now coming back to the R speak or the language conventions of R, we can put in a uh, Wilkinson Rogers formula in here which goes like cpk.lm which is the object to which we store the, uh, the, the, the product of the linear model if you will of cpk which is the outcome variable therefore it sits to the leftmost end then we initiate that with a tilde mark we add the age plus weight. Remember that that plus sign does not mean age and weight are added together. So age and weight. Then we specify the data. And then we order that we want a summary of that particular object, which is cpk.lm, which is stored in another object called some cpk. That's as simple as that. So let's see if we get the sum CPK, if so we print out sum CPK, what do we get out of that? That's the output from the regression model. And when we do this, we get to see the residuals. And you can see that these residuals, which is the residual of the composite model, do not exactly follow um, you know, a, a, a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. In other words, each and weight would have to be composite normal. In other words, the two variables in a three-dimensional space would um, you know, give you sort of a hill which looks like a normally distributed um, on all sides that you want to look at it. Well, certainly, I mean, the residuals do not tell us that. So there's something that we need to do about it. In the second part of this output, we get to see the beta coefficient. So for the intercept term, that we have included the intercept term here. We could not have, or we may, may not have included the intercept term here as well. And you can see that the intercept term is very big, minus 932. And then you can see that the T values and the P value for this, a T statistic and a P value for this term. And you can see that the P value is non-significant at uh, 0 0.05 levels. So you could, in theory, and you know, remove the intercept term because it's not going to add any more new information than what you've already got here. Then we've got the age in years, and you can see that the age in years is marginally significant at 0 0.05, and you can see that there is a there is an effect of minus seven. So as age increases, the CPK level comes down, is what it would suggest. And you see that the weight has got a, uh, a bigger uh, component to it, although we don't know whether weight is any bigger than, uh, weight's contribution is bigger than that. But what we know is this, that as weight increases um, per kg of the weight, there will be a corresponding increase in the CPK um, concentration in urine. The model itself is statistically significant um, at O5 level. And you know that the adjusted R score is around 40% with this configuration stating that about 40% roughly can be explained by uh, invoking these two variables alone. So this is how we extract that information and put it in here for you. So beta 0, the intercept term is minus 932, which has got a p-value of roughly 1.19. The b1 is minus um, 7.1 and so on and so forth. So we started with 18 observations we used up three variables. So now we've got like 15 degrees of freedom. And in a null hypothesis, you might uh, see that we have tested that all the coefficients are zero, which of course is not. So um, we could say that the statistics, uh, statistically, that this model is significant. The other thing that we can do is we can um, actually get an ANOVA table and we can find what could be the confidence interval for each of these three um, three variables. That is very, very simple. You can see that the confidence interval is um, 
for age it's minus 15.5 and ranges from 1.32 which means that the confidence interval itself traverses the value of zero and therefore we say that we just don't know it's very very wide the weight variable of course is also very broad uh, ranging between 4.74 to 42.5 and so when we conduct the ANOVA, we see that the ANOVA is significant as well. Both age and, um, and weight are significant um, in terms of the um, analysis of variance. Um, they are significant, although regression is not significant. But the analysis of variance then tries to figure out as to, um, as to what happens with this. So a few things to note here. And, uh, you know, you note that... Um, that both age and weight are significant in the analysis of variance. And when we start putting into the, into the ANOVA age and weight, we see that the weight is exactly as it is in the main table because weight was the first variable that we had put in into the regression model, then we added age. So when weight is used in the ANOVA model and then the, the weight is estimated. At that point, the regression coefficient or the significance values are exactly very similar to the one that you get to see here. But age is not because we have sequentially um, analyzed the analysis of variance. And the fact that the p-value of age does not agree with the p-value that we get to see in the main regression model tells you something and that tells you that there is a corresponding or there is a correlation between age and weight could be that as age increases the weight kind of drops down so young people are, tend to be a little heavier in this particular data set so which is why you would like to plot the age and weight or you'd like to run a correlation of the age and weight and see what the correlation tells us. The correlation tells us is this, that age is inversely related to weight, um, although it may or may not be statistically significant, but there is an inverse relationship. Now because of this, we see that the magnitude, the point estimate of the correlation is quite high, and this might explain why this was happening that when you put in age later on each became quite quite a significant of uh, remainder but when you put them in the into the in the in the in the regression equation together at the same time each was might not be uh, a major contributor of course weight was the more uh, more substantive contributor of the two so one of the things that we would like to do now based on our understanding of the regression model is this that we may omit the intercept term so let's omit the intercept term and run it over again remember that when we were running this um, regression model and we looked at the intercept term we stated that we could probably get rid of the intercept term because the intercept term didn't really add any additional information to us What's the way to do that is shown in this code block. So we created another um, object, which is now labeled as cpk.lm0. And we have um, stored in that object the product of the linear model, where we have, um, um, we, where we have regressed the creatine phosphokinase on age and weight. But we decided to take out the um, intercept term so we have put a minus one onto this. One other way in which you could uh, take out the intercept term is to put zero and then plus age plus weight. That would do the same thing. And then we print out the summary of the CPK term. So let's take a look at uh, the regression equations or the regression that come out with and without the intercept. So with the intercept, you get to see that, that um, you know, as before, um, age has got minus 7.12, the weight is 23.63, and you can see that the age is not statistically significant, but the weight is, and you can see that the adjusted R square gives you around um, 40%. But see what happens when the only variables that we consider are age and weight. The age is still negative, 
but it is um, it it has increased a little bit the magnitude of it and that's 9.47 but it has now attained a level of statistical significance the weight variable that parameter estimate has come down almost by 50 percent so from 23.6 it has come down to 11.9 and you can see that this again is statistically significant so both of them one after adjusting for the other has become statistically significant here and you also see that uh, the adjusted r square has gone up a lot which means that the that the model can now explain nearly 84 percent of the variability so the intercepts can you know um, explanatory power um, uh, you know, we just don't know what, what, what sense to make of this. So then you might ask and also take a look at the, uh, at the standard errors. You can see that in case of each, the standard error or the vi variability has come down, but come down a little bit, like from 3.96 to it has come down to something like 3.65. But note, the standard error for weight it has come down from 8.86 to something like 2.03 that's a huge drop almost like a 75 percent drop in the standard error you would like to question as to what does this mean so what we get to see is this that there is a reduction in the standard error for both age and weight but it's much more substantial for the weight variable than for the age variable this is because there was a correlation between the regression coefficients themselves of the intercept and the betas of the age and weight. So if we now take a look at the, in order to report that correlation, you report the summary of it, but then you say that, okay, I would like to have the, um, I'd like to have the correlation of, of, of the correlation coefficients, their correlations. Then you see that between the intercept and age it's minus 44, but between the intercept and weight, that is very, very high. That is, um, um, that is almost uh, 0.97. And then there is a correlation between the weight and the age, um, which we don't understand why it's not negative, but you can see that there is a relationship between weight and the intercepts, betas. That tells you that when you take out the intercept term, then the uh, then immediately the standard error shrinks a lot because now, you know, you don't really have to worry about um, you know the, the the variability shrinks a lot, particularly more for weight variable, which is a higher um, correlation with with the intercept. So let's take a look at the at the diagnostic plots. Because remember, the diagnostic plots tell us quite a bit about the um, about the outliers and things like that. And you can see here that, um, that there seems to be some sort of a pattern in the residuals. So the relationship may not exactly be a linear. And you can also see that the residuals are not exactly a straight line uh, as far as a normal QQ plot. So the residuals are not really uh, normally distributed, which was not really a surprise at this stage. And you can see that if you take the standard error residuals and fitted values, you see that as the fitted values increase, there is a tendency that the residuals are also going to increase a little bit. So this is a phenomenon which is often referred to as heteroscedasticity. So it hints that a linear model probably is not the best way to explain the association between these variables and the CPK. But look at the leverage. We had discussed already the issues of leverage in, um, you know, when we were discussing um, influencers and the and the outliers, and leverage is is the phenomenon where an outlying variable would like to likely to pick up on um, or, or move the um, the the association or the fit line, um, you know, in one direction or the other. So if we continue with the diagnostic plot, you can see that there is a uh, there is an issue of, of the leverage 
that we get to see. So what we'll do is here we'll we'll examine that a little bit more closely, and we see that you know the the leverage itself um, indicates that point number one one zero may be a culprit. That may be a factor which is going to distort the association between CPK and these variables. In order to better understand the leverage, we create what is known as a hat matrix. And that hat matrix is, um, is, is created on the basis of, the, of a phenomenon which is known as the model matrix. So when we've got a model, you know, the model actually produces a matrix. Unfortunately, at this stage, um, we do not really have sufficient time or um, you know, this is, this is beyond the scope of this particular lecture to explain in details about the model matrix. But you can use a model matrix, um, you know, in order to generate what is known as a predicted model matrix or a hat matrix. And that hat matrix will give us a sense of the, um, of, of the leverage as to which point is actually becoming more and more, um, more and more uh, important in understanding this. So what we do basically is we um, plot the leverage points but we also plot what is known as a studentized residuals, often referred to as jackknife residuals. So what it does is it does a procedure which is known as cross-validation and resampling of the data. And by doing that, you can get a set of jackknife residuals. And here are the two things, right? You can see that both the jackknife and the uh, studentized residuals, but more I mean, both the jackknife as well as the leverage um, statistics suggest that there is one point which is like, you know, um, point number 110 is the one that is, um, that is responsible for, um, for this. So if you could remove that, uh, you know, 1110 point, maybe uh, we could have a different set of parameters. Lastly, of course, we are working it backwards. There is this issue around um, scatterplot matrix. And this is also another important point that we should note here when we are playing with R. Remember that I told you that when you start um, your data analysis, it's very important that you have to have a visual output of your data. This is where you do that. You plot a scatterplot matrix to get a sense of the various variables that you get to see here. So we issue the command pairs um, blood CPK. And in the panel that results, we say, okay, give me the smoothed data of the pairs of data that we get to see here. And you can see from here that the relationships may not exactly be a linear, can be a curvilinear relationship. So before we finish this, a couple of other points. One is this, that there are some core assumptions in multiple linear regression. Um, in the multiple linear regression, we'd really like to find out the um, the expected value of y, like a fitted value of y. And that is based on the alpha, the beta 1 of the x1 value, the beta 2 of the x2 value, and so on. You can fit as many variables as you like, so beta p times xp. The distribution of y is normal, and the expected value of y, that should be the mean, which... And, you know, the, the variance is constant. And the other thing is this, that the, the, the y, x1, xp, they're all multivariate, normally distributed. Like if these could be spread into a, onto a space, that space is, you know, you could conceptualize a three-dimensional hill for like three variables that will give you sort of a, um, uh, so normal distribution of the two, two variables. It is not necessary that all these things will be honored or all these assumptions will be met. But nevertheless, a multiple linear regression is a reasonable starting point to see what are the associations or guess if we can need to make some transformations that will make it a little bit more meaningful. So to summarize, um, you know, there are some strategies. You examine the distribution of each of these variables. You check for outliers and skewness. You go for a scatterplot matrix to see that their distributions. Mm -hmm. And then if needed, you need to transform those variables. Well, we'll see how we do that. And then, um, then finally, we kind of extended the concepts of a simple binary uh, linear regression 
and we learn that we can identify outliers in these things and we can um, do certain things. In the next phase, we're going to look into the concepts of variable selections and model building. All right, so keep learning. Welcome back. Now that you had a sense or a way of working with the, um, the simple bits of multiple linear regression, it's just in small chunks. So you learn that you can set up a multiple linear regression um, equation in R. You, can, you saw that you have to follow the Wilkinson-Rogers formula of having an outcome variable and uh, two um, continuously distributed variables. There are still a few more tasks to be accomplished. Remember that in the same as in the simple linear regression, we are still looking at um, outliers and influencers and some plots. And this is what we're going to explore in the next bit. Okay. So again, um, bring out your data sets and get rolling with us. Thanks. And let's uh, move on to the next bit, which is multiple linear regression two of outliers, influencers, and other advanced bits. Thanks.